for a pull with a paddle in your way through the water, but we are in a canoe, you can paddle and pull the water back and the canoe goes ahead. But one other thing that a paddle can be used for is a rudder. Do you guys know what a rudder is in a boat? Okay, I think maybe some of the grown-ups would know what a rudder is in a boat. But a rudder, it would be like if I was in a canoe and I'm paddling on the left-hand side, if I just stick my canoe paddle in the water at an angle like this, then the water coming along the canoe hits the paddle and it slows that water down. And what it does is it will pull my whole canoe to the left. So I'm ruddering the canoe to the left. And if I did the same on the right-hand side, it would pull it to the right. So the canoe paddle is not, it becomes a rudder for the canoe. And the reason we're talking about that is the Bible tells us that the tongue is like a rudder for our life. The tongue is like a, even though it's small, it can control a lot of what happens by what we say. And the Bible says the tongue is like a horse's bridle. A horse's bridle is very small, but it can control a great big horse. So what we say with our mouths is very important. And it says, the Bible says we should be swift to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And that's because the, the tongue is like a rudder or a bridle. It has a lot of ability to control where we're going. So how about you guys? Can you guys put your hand on the paddle? You want to hold it? And then everybody can join us in the echo prayer. Dear Lord, Dear Lord, help me, help me to be swift to listen, to be swift to listen, slow to speak, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And, slow to anger. and we ask this, we ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All that help. Yeah, it's kind of nice that even, I mean, uh, Joy has a gift with the prayer, and Dustin has, has helped us so much with uh, being able to record the services for YouTube. It's kind of nice that we have those um, opportunities. But uh, this this morning, I'd like to preach more of a practical sermon. A lot of sermons, you know, definitely address salvation or being filled with the Holy Spirit, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Um, and those are all necessary in the most important messages. But once in a while, the Lord will lay on my heart just a more practical sermon for perhaps for your marriage, for your family life, for our church life, for the community life, um, for our country. I think to have better listening skills would help our whole country. Can anybody say amen? amen. Have you ever noticed like the, the commentators now, if they have a guest on, do you think it's a fair conversation, or is it pretty much two people talking over each other the whole time so that you can't really hear, you know, what's uh, taking place? And uh, so that's why I wanted to be able to address this because I think it fits so much of our lives as Christians, but really the life in our, our country is, as well. And the title of the message is Be Quick to Listen. And uh, a kind of a humorous thing that I we had a comedian not too long ago uh, at the other church that uh, we just watched a tape of his and he had a discussion about the listening problems that husband and wives have together and they were driving somewhere and this fellow I may have even shared this once with you I can't remember or at least a Bible study but this husband and wife were driving somewhere and he had so enjoyed Dunkin Donuts Dunkin Donuts was one of his favorite favorite places, but he, he could never just have one donut. He always had to have two two donuts at least. So he knew it was best for him just to give up Dunkin' Donuts completely. So he gave up Dunkin' Donuts and um, was driving along and lo and behold, they happened to drive by a Dunkin' Donut uh, coffee shop. And so kind of just kind of breathing out, he just kind of was exasperated a little bit. So he just said, Dunkin' Donuts. You know, just kind of breathed it out. And um, he started noticing, though, the next few miles that his wife started scowling. And uh, he was talking to her, but she wasn't answering him at all. And he, he, about 15 miles later, 15 minutes later, he said, he said, honey, is there something wrong? Because you haven't talked to me for the last 15 miles. She turned to him and she said, I don't condone what? Get it? Don't condone? <laughs> he said, 
What do you mean don't condone? She said, just 15 minutes ago, you said I don't condone something, and I would like to know what I don't condone. So he said, I never said don't condone. I said Dunkin' Donuts. I just gave up Dunkin' Donuts. No, you didn't. You said don't condone, and I want to know what I don't condone. So we know how life is like that. You can, uh, you know, we can misunderstand what people are saying. I think that's half the arguments. Maybe if we all got checked for hearing aids, we'd have less fights at home, you know, between husbands and wives at least, because I think a lot of times it's, or in our families with our kids and parents, I think sometimes it's a listening problem. And, but the Bible gave us good instruction on this from James, and he actually almost includes a whole chapter, chapter 3, on the power of the tongue. The importance of listening and the power of the tongue. And I want to preach, though, from James 1, verses 19 and include 20 as well. So I read in the King James Version here. So then, my beloved brethren, that's everyone. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. The same as quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to wrath. So everybody say, swift to hear. Slow to speak. And slow to wrath. wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So, um, let's. I want to take a look at this uh, this morning. Swift to listen. Present day life in America does not have many people that are swift to listen. Quick to be the listening ear. We're more ready to talk than we are to listen. And I think this is evident, like, as I mentioned, especially on the news shows. And it doesn't matter if this is a, a liberal news show or a conservative news show, especially if they're interviewing somebody from the opposite viewpoint. The chance that that person is going to get much of word in, like, you know, sideways, is unlikely because people don't want to listen. They just want to spot off their view. And the same thing happens. Um, on social media, instead of somebody, you know, someone spouts their, off their beliefs and all of a sudden you have no one listening, you only have people putting their view, another view, counter view, another view, no one, I have to often wonder, has anybody actually read what the other person wrote? Or are they just saying what they want to say? And, and then it filters down to our families, the cell phone becomes another big separator between people list, talking and listening. So you have parents that want to talk to kids. I, I, I had laughed this morning at early service and I didn't scold them. I scolded the parents too. And we had three kids looking at their iPads. I said, everybody listen to Pastor Doug. Everyone, all of you little ones listen to I said three times before I got them to break from that, their, their iPads. And then I said, well, not just the kids. How about the grown-ups? Have you ever seen a restaurant, a, a child just wanting to talk to mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, and they can't get, up, they can't get them to listen for one minute because they're so glued into their cell phones. So this is exasperating the problem, and as well as our computers and television and all the things that, that normally cause bad listening. Now, I've always said... People, it's a dumb joke, but I've always said there's a male pattern deafness. That is, men have trouble listening to women. And, and that's chauvinistic to me. And they cannot hear their wives at all. And how many of you experienced that with your spouses? Were you trying to get them to listen and they just have zoned out? Judy can put her hand up too, because I know it's happened to her. She resorts to my, my mom used to say to my dad, Reverend Burns? And he. He'd break out of it. It's like he was breaking out of a zombie zone or something like that. And Judy does the same thing to me, and it usually works. You know, she says, Reverend Burns, it usually catches my attention. But that's a bad thing, that we are, don't have good listening skills, and I think it's just been exasperated. It drives me crazy that you cannot watch a news program and really get what, a, what the guest is trying to share, because the other person, you know, wants to spout off all of their beliefs. So, listening is a more, I think it's a spiritual thing. I think God needs to give us the gift of listening better to one another and also to the Lord. Because, you know what, if you go to prayer, 
When you go to the prayer of the Lord, who talks more, you or the Lord? You know, if you get ten words and God gets one word, that's not really fair, is it? And so we should spend more time listening to the Lord. When you read the Bible, do you read it for information or do you read it for formation? You know, I told the kids down there at Christ Church, you can read, everybody can read one verse of the Bible and get something out of it if you really meditated on that verse. So if you read a verse and then you said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, God may speak to you about one word in that verse or something. So we need these listening skills with God, but we also need them with people. When I was in college and I took a lot of counseling classes, it was more about listening than it was talking. If you were to be a good counselor, you had to have good listening skills. You had to be able to listen clearly to the person. And even when you spoke, when you spoke, it was help to help them to speak what was going on. You asked questions to try to let them talk more. You know, bring some conversation out from them and help you listen better. So we need, we need better listening skills. I thank the Lord with my, my mom had great listening skills even though she had significant hearing problems. And we found out more and more as my mom got older that she had very significant healing problems. She, she had a hearing problems. She had, uh, first she had hearing aids that she had to really have really high for her to be able to hear. And uh, the only humorous thing was when it got too loud in the bird's house, she'd go, you watch her go whoop. And she'd whoop. And she'd turn those hearing aids right down and she was perfectly at peace. Because she got it, finally got it quieter for her, but it was not a funny problem at all because it got so significant. We went down to Pittsburgh to Monitor Hospital to the hearing to a hearing specialist, and the, the hearing specialist doctor took my mom into the testing room, put earphones over that had sound to them, different pitches, different volume. When my mom came out of the testing zone, uh, the the doctor sat her down and she says, you're a very good lip reader, aren't you? Because my mom was not hearing 80% of what we should hear. Her hearing was down to 20%. So she was reading people's lips that she was found a way to make do. So what they did was give her a cochlear implant. And what that is, is it's an amazing invention. They have all these probes that will go right down into your inner ear and they replace the nerves that have broken down. And I forget how many, there's like 18 of them and it matches the number of nerves that you have. And they go down into your inner ear and, and from there they can, there's no problem from the inner ear to the brain, they, then you can get that sound. And it's called a cochlear implant because part of it's on the inside and part of it's on the outside, the battery pack and thing that goes into your actual ear canal. And so my mom had to get used to wearing this cochlear implant that had a magnet that would, the outside part would stick to the inside part. So she still had her back up when it got too loud, she would just pull the magnet off. And it got really quiet for her in the Burns household with all 13 grandkids and, and lots of other now great-grandchildren, a few great-grandchildren. but. When my mom first put that on, it was, you realized how important listening was because her eyes brightened. My dad used to always call her bright eyes, you know, Mom Jean, bright eyes. And her eyes brightened because she could finally hear again. But she said, you all sound like robots because a cochlear implant, it's digitalized sound. So it sounds more like a robot. But this is how amazing our God is that in a few months, my mom's brain, God allowed her brain to transpose those digital sounds into more regular human sounds. Because the brain said that's not what a human voice sounds like. Isn't that amazing? How amazing our God is? And my mom would say, oh, now I'm hearing you all like I usually heard you. My mom had exceptional listening skills even though she was hearing impaired. And we're all spiritually hearing impaired, and we need deeper listening skills. And especially with, with us kids and grandkids, I think she really had good listening skills. Much better than my dad. He was the talker. Mom was the listener. 
And um, uh, the, one of the greatest things she had was spiritual listening skills. Down at the prayer room at Christ Church, I have a staff that my mom had in the corner of her bedroom. And in that corner, she had her chair, her Bible, a, a, a shepherd's staff, and a beautiful picture, just like our stained glass picture here of Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. And my mom would say, I'm going to the shepherd's corner. I'm going to listen to the Lord. And she would go in and pray and listen to the Lord. How beautiful, right? You know? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And my sheep know my voice. You can't know the Lord's voice if you aren't listening. Can you say amen? amen. If we got so much going on in our lives. And we're so concentrating on our phones or the television or the computer. Um, or even the, the, you know, I love adventure and I have to be careful that it doesn't take over my passion for the Lord. Because we should be most passionate about the shepherd, the good shepherd, so that we can continue to hear his voice. So we should be swift to listen. Everybody say, I shall be, I shall be. swift to listen. Swift to listen. Can you mean that? <laughs> you got to do it at home, okay? Make sure you remind your husbands about, you know, even if they heard it or if they didn't hear it. Jim was at the early service. So remind them, swift to listen. You can tell Steve, swift to listen. And uh, our kids, um, we need to be able to tell them, be swift to listen. And we need to be swift to listen to our kids, to actually hear them. You know, your parents are talking to you. How much do you really take in? Or do you say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to really make an effort to listen to what uh, they're saying to me. And the second is slow to speak. Uh, the Bible says, uh, James says in the 26th verse, if any of you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, um, he deceives his own heart. So if somebody says, well, I'm a religious person, but you can't bring your tongue under control, the Bible says you deceive your heart. You know, and how, how about that for any of us? We all say harsh things. We all say inappropriate things. We all say things at the wrong time, in the wrong way to the wrong person. You know, so if we cannot bridle, if we cannot be slow, to, can't learn to be slow to speak, we can get into great trouble. And just like I said, we have to be able to control the tongue so that we control the direction that we're going. Think about when you get into an argument or discussion, if you're quick to speak, pretty soon you set up a trajectory of where you're going that's not a good place. Amen? Amen. Happens in the Burns household. Happens for Judy and I. You get into a discussion, if you're not swift to listen and you're not slow to speak, you can pretty soon be on the wrong trajectory. That's where, um, that's where the last point comes, slow to anger. I often wonder, why, are they, why is James jumping into anger here? Because that's exactly where this leads to if it goes the wrong way, right? If you're, if you're not listening and you're quick to speak, you're likely to end up where? In anger. Angry with one another. So we need to be slow to speak. And the lesson learned that the tongue, though it be so small a member of the body, the Bible says it has great power. In fact, um, Paul uses, which was the metaphor and simile? He said, Paul, the tongue is fire. It's not like fire, the tongue is fire. If it's going to say the wrong, if it starts to say the wrong thing, it's going to go uh, as badly as it possibly can. Because the tongue is the bridle, a tongue is a rudder, a tongue is a fire. I look up the statistics for the the, how bad the fire is in California. In 2017, right now, to this, I think it was pretty close to this point in time, but it's climbing every minute. In California, 853,457 acres have burned. Almost a, probably a million acres, you know, as we speak, have burned, all started by a small fire. So you wonder why there's troubles at home. You wonder why there's troubles in the community. You wonder why troubles at times start in the church? Because we don't take care of how we're using our tongue. How we're speaking about others. Something happens, we think we've got to figure out what happens, and how many times is it something 
more praiseworthy than people are thinking? Or how many times does your brain go in the wrong direction? And the Bible says that's worldly wisdom, not righteous wisdom. Righteous wisdom would point your brain in the right direction. You know, we should be more merciful in the church, and in fact, we're less merciful. We, we bring people into judgment immediately when we see something that we think we figured out what happened. God forgive us, amen? I've, I've been through this enough. I've been in 30 years in the ministry. And I, I was one time called, I, I didn't see this in any other church. I was one time, I, I said, we need to pray for our church because the devil's attacking our church. And a guy looked right at me, he said, I think the devil's in the pulpit. How about hearing that word? Justin, get ready. Because <laughs> it's not always, it's not always the way it should be. That's because the devil is battling against the church. Amen? All I, all I wanted to do was that church to be full. And if that church was full, let's start another service. If that service is full, maybe we have to build. So why would this guy call me to death? You know, because his tongue wasn't in control. In his control, or uh, in the Lord's control, it was more in his control. And he set a fire. He came back to me many years later after he had his own church. He pastored the uh, Dawson Church for a little while. And he came back to me and said, I have to apologize to you. Because what I said to you was harsh and judgmental, and I shouldn't have said it. I said, are you finding about the other side of the church, are you? You know, and it was hard for me to forgive him. You know, and, and uh, but I, I need to. I have to try, even though because this is, people kindle these fires because they're not slow to speak. And they're speaking not in, um, they're not speaking in heavenly wisdom, they're speaking in worldly wisdom. And therefore, they're saying the wrong things. The last one, um, uh, did you get? Did I get to have you say slow to speak? Say, I will, I will. Be, slow to speak. be slow to speak. You know, so I'm, I'm saying this looking at Judy. So I really, <laughs> I really got to keep this one. <laughs> She's had two services too. <laughs> I will be slow to speak. I will be slow to speak. And you know, you can even say that. How many times do you? What if we all just said, I would, when you were ready, you were ready to bite your lip or ready to say something nasty or whatever, what if you just said, I will, under your breath, you would say, I will be swift to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. What a difference that could make, hmm? If we just, if we just try, try that out. And that's, that leads us to the last one, slow to anger. What if we were slow to grow angry and swift to do good? What if we were slow to speak harshly and swift to speak kindly? You know, what a difference it would make, amen? What about on Facebook? I am, you know, I am literally ashamed of a lot that I see pastors write and Christian people write. But I'm just ashamed, as ashamed as the worldly people that write what you see on Facebook, what people say or what they symbolize on Facebook, you know, we ought to be embarrassed. The animal kingdom would be embarrassed of us because of how bad it's gone. And it's, it's all a spiritual matter. It's really a spiritual matter because if you are not supposed to listen and you are not supposed to speak, you are heading on a trajectory for anger. And when you're angry, all holds are are off all, all you know you're going to say whatever finally you're going to say whatever comes to mind and uh, James chapter 2 1 through 4 says sometimes this comes from our partiality think about one person what some person says about another person just because they're a different race how many black people do you know how, how do you really speak harshly against them unless you know them are you just going to believe the worst of that race or, you know, if you have black people and they speak harshly about white people, how many white people do you actually know? You know, if there's a black person, take the time to get to know and be friend. You know, I'm grateful for some friendships I still have from high school. You know, uh, uh, what I shared in, in Bible study, one of my friends, Kevin, said that in Prospect in Johnstown, the white people were not allowed to walk down the street. You'll walk down the paths behind the house. That was an unwritten rule for the white kids in Prospect because there were so many more black kids. 
And Kevin said he was really friend, good friends. I think I shared this in Bible study. He was good friends with one of the, the boys. And so all of a sudden this boy made a mistake and started down Prospect Street. And a whole gang of black kids jumped on him and started beating him up. And Kevin ran out and he said, I may have looked like I was joining the black kids in roughing this kid up, but I really was staying between them and him. And he whispered to him. He said, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm trying to protect you. And he, this boy looked up at him and said, if you were here for me, you'd stand with me. And Kevin, this young black guy, said, he's, he's probably 50, he's 57, 58 years old. He said, Doug, that's stuck with me to this day. You know, if we're not doing what's right, then, then we're part of what's wrong. And we are operating in demonic wisdom, not heavenly wisdom, like uh, the Bible says. I, I didn't focus on this as much in the other services, but this is so. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, demonic. So anytime you're self-seeking, anytime, you know, think about when you talk with your kids. If they take on this tone that they're right all the time, all the time, that if you need to pray for them because they have, they have a demonic wisdom rather than a heavenly wisdom. But, but if they're speaking good things and if they're speaking with mercy, then they're, they're speaking with the, the wisdom of heaven. And we need to be able... Um, it says there, right, this was all in the third chapter, it says, um, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure and then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Who? It's getting hard for me. Anybody like to yield in an argument? <laughs> if we don't want to yield in an argument, where is that wisdom coming from? But the Bible says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those that make peace. And that comes to the last one. You're either sowing anger or you're sowing peace and kindness. You're either sowing anger or you're sowing peace and kindness. And that's why in the third chapter, and I close with this, where James said, he said, think about the tongue. Remember this part where it says, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. So if we're praising God with our tongues, then how can we curse our brother who's made in God's image? Important words. Huh? I mean, I'll tell you what, I'm going to say President Trump needs this message. You know? I heard somebody had a sign up there, tweet others like you would like to be tweeted. You know? But think about that for yourself, because every, every time you point your finger at somebody else, you have to realize that one of I operated the same way. And the, and the liberal, I will say this, the liberal people have said just as cruel and harsh things about Trump as he ever said about anyone. So it's a human problem. That we have, and it has it has only a spiritual solution. Everybody say, swift to listen, swift to listen. slow to speak, slow to speak. And, slow to and slow to anger. Dear Lord God, we ask that uh, as hard as this is for all of us, myself included, how easy it is to feel like we have a right to our viewpoint and our argument. And we do not want to yield. But Lord, let us be able to practice this, to be swifter to listening, slower to speaking, 
And then we will never even reach the anchor point. Lord, help us. And help our country with this, Lord God. We, we need a spiritual revival so that you might save us from ourselves. And we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.